we come to John. In terms of uh, the, the overall story, right, we have uh, the, the offspring of the woman is promised to triumph over the serpent and his offspring. That promise is narrowed to Abraham and uh, his offspring. And then, um, then that promise, I'm going fast, then that promise is narrowed to David and his offspring. That promise will be fulfilled in the new covenant. You have a new covenant. The promises given to Abraham and David will be fulfilled in the new covenant, in the new creation, in the new exodus, and with a new David. So as we open the New Testament, all those things are fulfilled in an inaugurated way, in an already not yet dimension. We have a new David, of course, in Jesus, the new and and, and we could say we have the last Adam, right, as well. We have the new exodus, the, the new redemptive event in Jesus' death and resurrection. So we have, the new creation has dawned as well, and uh, the new covenant is fulfilled. The, the Holy Spirit has been given, which is one of the promises of the new covenant, and the law is placed on the heart of uh, God's people. We saw, especially in the Synoptic Gospels, that the kingdom has come, but the kingdom has come in a surprising way. It has not come with apocalyptic power. We have a prophecy fulfilled in the coming of the king and the kingdom, but also a mystery revealed. We saw that especially in the parables. We have a mystery revealed because the kingdom has come in an unexpected way. It's come as a mustard seed. It's come as uh, uh, just a, a little bit of leaven put in the dough that's hidden. Um, so uh, the kingdom has arrived. It's arrived in a surprising way through the servant of the Lord. It's arrived through the death of the king, the death and the resurrection. But we, all, we know the Jews did not anticipate uh, the death of the king. So now we come to, to John, and, and John, we, we recognize immediately that John is different from the three synoptic gospels. John, John only speaks of the kingdom of God uh, four times in, 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 in his gospel. Instead, as you all know, John focuses on eternal life. John, John focuses on the life of the kingdom. Is that, uh, is that warranted to say he focuses on the life of the kingdom? Um, I think it is because I would argue that eternal life in John is... Um, an already not yet phenomenon. So believers already have eternal life, but that eternal life is not yet uh, consummated. Here's another way to put it. Instead of, we ought not to think abstractly about eternal life, but eternal life is the life of the age to come. The life of the age to come has entered this present evil age. So the, es the eschatological promise of life is, is now ours. So John, John emphasizes what is called realized eschatology. In New Testament studies, there are some scholars who deny that, Paul, that John has any future eschatology at all. Are you familiar with that? So some scholars argue, Rudolf Bultmann, for instance, some scholars argue that John's eschatology is wholly realized and there's no future whatsoever. Now, I think that's an overstatement. However, it's helpful. It's helpful because, <coughs> excuse me, because John does emphasize realized eschatology. He emphasizes that we have the life now. So let's just look at, really, we can look at one verse. He does it over and over again, or maybe two. Truly, truly, Jesus says, I tell you, truly I tell you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who, is sent, who sent me has eternal life, has it now, the life of the age to come, and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death to life. And uh, it's interesting to notice, for those of you who know Greek, that Metabebacon, we have a perfect tense verb, emphasizing 
the, a, a past event with ongoing consequences, that eternal life is a, an existing reality, so that believers have already passed out of death in, in, into life. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe we'll look at one, one more. Just John 3, 15. Everyone who believes in him uh, may have eternal life, even now. And then um, John 3.16 says something very similar. But if we drop down to 3.36, the one who believes in the Son has eternal life, present tense, right now, but the one who disobeys the Son shall not see light, but the wrath of God abides on him even now. Again, the present tense, that the wrath of God abides on the person. So we could look at text after text after text that emphasizes that eternal life is now the present possession for, for believers. However, I just want to say here that Boltman is wrong that there's no future to mention. Boltman is wrong when he says there's no already not yet in John. And we actually know that from the same chapter we looked at earlier, John 5, 28 and 29. Do not be amazed at this. Just a few verses later, right? Because the time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and will come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. So clearly John believes there's a future dimension to this life, that the resurrection of the dead is coming. So I think we see a clear indication here that John believed in an already but not yet. There's a, there's a proviso. We have eternal life, but we await the day of physical resurrection. You might wonder, what did Boltman do with those verses, right? So clear. Anybody know? I don't expect you to know. I just wondered if you did. Uh, he argued that these verses were a gloss, by which he meant they were not part of the gospel, that they were added by a later editor. What evidence does he have to substantiate that claim? None. There's no textual evidence for that. But his response is it had to be added later. Why did it have to be added later? Because John didn't have a future eschatology. It's begging the question, though, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, he's, he's determining in advance what's going on. I mean, that, that I call that, I call that can't lose exegesis, right? You can't lose. Because anything that goes against your theory, you just throw out. So um, it reminds me of the person that uh, wrote a, a dissertation from a very conservative point of view, arguing that oinos in the New Testament is always grape juice. And I said, well, what about the, 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 when good people are drinking it? I said, what about the passages when they get drunk? Well, then, then, it's, then it's wine. But, but all the other passages, whenever Jesus and his disciples are drinking in its grape juice, well, you can't lose, right? <laughs> you can't lose in that theory. That's, that's not, I'm, obviously, I'm not an advocate of getting drunk. So, but that's, that's, not, um, that's not exegesis. Well, uh, we're, we're very familiar with this, aren't we, uh, this uh, eternal life is obtained by believing. I'll say more about that. The eternal life focuses on Jesus. We're not surprised, are we? Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus has come so we can have abundant life. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Eternal life comes uh, by knowing Jesus. The gospel was written so that you'd know Jesus is the Christ and you should have life in his name. So, um, a very, very prominent theme, isn't it? But it focuses on Jesus himself. Life, life comes from knowing, knowing Jesus. Uh, and we see in 1 John 5.13 that the same theme is in the epistle. <coughs> the, the epistle is written so that you may know you have eternal life. We're, as evangelicals, we're very familiar with this theme, rightly so. Uh, you, we remind ourselves when, when we read something like this at the Council of Trent, an anathema 
the, the, the Council of Trent pronounced an anathema on anybody who claims that they know that they are saved or that they know they have eternal life. So they pronounce an anathema, a curse, unless God grants it to you by special revelation, a.k.a. basically no one. <laughs> That's what they mean by that. Because if you could say, well, he granted it to me by special revelation through his word, <laughs> they said, no, no, that's not what they're talking about, right? So, uh, but we have good biblical warrant, don't we, to say that the biblical writers, John here in particular, the, the biblical writers write in such a way that as believers we have assurance and we know that we are believers. It's one of the cases where we see the deficiency in Roman Catholic theology, where it's uh, not, not uh, fully biblical. So that's not a hard thing to understand. We also see in John very prominently a very high Christology. Now, we, we have a high Christology in the synoptics, but it's very striking the language about Jesus being the Son of God in, in the gospel. I'm not going to linger on that. If we were doing John, we could spend more time on it. But I do, I do want to say, when, uh, make a comment here that I think could be of help. When Nathaniel says in chapter 1, verse 49, you're the Son of God, you're the King of Israel, I don't think, in its historical context, that Nathaniel is saying, you're God. <laughs> You're God and you're the Messiah. I mean, one minute Nathaniel's saying, can anything come from Nazareth? You know, zip zap, 30 seconds later, he's saying you're God. I think by son of God there, son of God is also, remember the king is the son. son I think he means you're the son of God, you're the king. Okay, first point. Second point, that's what I think Nathaniel meant. When you read the whole of the gospel, it's clear that John, as the author of the gospel, writing probably in the 90s or 80s, somewhere around there, last gospel to be written, I think it's also clear that when John is writing, now the Son of God, given all our references here, is invested with a, a deeper meaning. Son of God also means he's divine. So John invites you, as an author, to read that at two levels. Right, you read it at the level of what Nathaniel's saying. I think the tr same is true of Peter in Matthew 16 when he says, "You're you're the Christ, you're the Son of God." I don't think I don't think Peter's there saying you're divine, but Matthew, in light of the whole, is that a poison gas being injected into this room? So, well, I'll see if those of you at the back start to faint, uh, we'll leave and maybe we'll help you out if we have time. So, <laughs> but want to save ourselves first. Anyway, just kidding. Um, I've become distracted. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah, Son, son of God, son of God, um, son of God refers, I think, both in Matthew 16 and John 1 to Jesus being the king. But both in Matthew and in John, in light of the whole, now it's invested with a deeper meaning that uh, Jesus is truly the son of God. He is, he is God himself ultimately the second person of the Trinity. So I think that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, do you want to say anything about the first two things I said? You know, not, not terribly controversial. Just a, just a word about John 1.1. 1, 1. Maybe, maybe it's easier to see it actually up here. Instead of, uh, even though I have the Greek there, but I think it's, so, uh, you're very familiar with this verse. In the beginning, resonating with Genesis, in the beginning God created in the heavens and the earth, in the beginning was the Word. So you see John's distinctive Logos Christology. Of course, there's so much we could say about Logos. We, we think very back to the earliest Greek thinkers trying, trying to figure out the nature of reality. Uh, or you think of Stoicism, where uh, the wise person lived according to nature, which means uh, living according to reason, and the word reason is logos, right? To live according to nature is to live according to reason and is to live according to the logos. Uh, and the, the, log, the logos indicates that there's a, a rationality in the world. 
Of course, it's a very different worldview, isn't it? Stoicism is pantheistic, and it doesn't believe in a personal deity. So, um, but, but still, it ha would have associations, the word logos, with anybody who was familiar with Greek thought and Greek philosophy, which had a r remarkable influence, even on the early Christians. I mean, you know the, er the early church fathers picked up this language of the sper spermaticus logos, and they picked up this language and said that people like Socrates were Christians, which I think is debatable. But uh, certainly there's a Greek background. But I think the fundamental background, and uh, maybe I mentioned this earlier, I think the fundamental background here is the Old Testament itself, where we see uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and he created the heavens and the earth by his word. Yeah, I, I talked about that the first day, didn't I? He, talked, he created the earth, heavens and earth by his word. So in the beginning was the word. That ain is, this is a beginning that has no beginning. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is a, how, do you, how do you talk about this? A beginning with no beginning. A beginning with no end. Uh, it, it exceeds our capability to describe. But that imperfect tense verb, in the beginning, forever and ever and ever was the Word. And the Word was forever and ever and ever with God. I don't think it's because of the preposition pros. I think some people say pros indicates fellowship. I think that's overreading a preposition. It's not, it's, not the, it's not the preposition. It's the context that tells us that we have a personal relationship between the Logos and God. So the Logos is distinct from God right? He was with God, and, 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 the Logos, and the Logos was God. And of course, there you see the predicate nominative. If you don't know this, what I'm talking about, just let it wash over you. We don't have time to get into the details. We see the predicate nominative preceding the verb, the copula, and uh, there, in, in such situations, the predicate is definite, not indefinite. As you see in the New World Translation, he was a god, which, you know, it's fascinating. They've never released their translators. Who translated that book? You know, I worked on the Christian Standard Bible. Every, every reputable translation puts in their literature who the translators are. Because one of the things you want to know is, are they qualified? <laughs> Did they know the languages? We have no idea. I, they probably didn't in the New World Translation. So we have no idea who did this and they, uh, when, in rendering a God. But it, it emphasizes, it emphasizes uh, that he's fully divine. Also, since you have ton theon and then theos, he probably the article is also not repeated because he doesn't want uh, the readers to fall into the air of modalism, right? Of collapsing the word into who God is. The, the word is fully God. God is fully God. That is the Father. They, they, they share the same what? John doesn't use this language, but we have to use some language. We follow the early church here. They share the same essence and being, right? And yet they're distinct. They're distinct persons. So, again, that's a, that's a very important, important verse for our theology. And then, and then so the, the high Christology in John, the book ends with Thomas saying, my Lord and my God, you probably know that uh, some, some Jehovah Witnesses have interpreted this as Thomas saying, my Lord and my God. Right? He's standing looking at Jesus, but then he looks up. That, could there be a more implausible interpretation? It's almost funny. And the other interpretation is he basically takes the Lord's name in vain. Oh, my God. <laughs> but he doesn't, he's not talking to Jesus. I don't think Jesus would be happy with that. Right? Taking the Lord's name in vain? Oh, my Lord. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Right? <laughs> that is a very bad interpretation. He clearly... Clearly, John intends us to read that as Thomas is addressing Jesus as Lord and God. And then, and then the I am statements, so prominent in 
John, we'll look at these quickly, but going back to Exodus 3, I am who I am. Isaiah, I the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. So we see that in Isaiah a number of times. And, and, um, and then in John, Jesus uh, regularly identifies himself with I am statements. Isn't it interesting, you're, you're aware of this, that he identifies himself as the Messiah clearly to the Samaritan woman, because she's not going to start some revolution, right? So there he can just be frank. I'm the Messiah. But he doesn't, he doesn't do that to others. The other, the other thing I want to say is we have, um, we have in John a linkage often between an action and an I am statement. So we have the feeding of the 5,000, and Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. We have the healing of the blind man, and Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. We have the raising from the dead of Lazarus, and Jesus says, I am the resurrection and, and the life. Um, you know, so again, we could spend a lot of time on these. I think one, you know, one of the interesting ones is when Jesus is arrested, Jesus says, I am. Are you Jesus? He could be, it could be self-identification, right? I am could be just, it is I. But I don't think John interprets it that way because they all fall, because they all fall to the ground, like a theophany, right? So I don't, th I don't think it's just I am, oh, okay. They, they fall to the ground, and Jesus basically has to say, come, come arrest me. Okay, we will. <laughs> so the I am statements are very important. Then, uh, then John emphasizes that Jesus' uh, Jesus's death in terms of his lifting up and glorifying. So when John thinks of Jesus' death, he uses a different idiom, doesn't he? He uses the language of lifting up being glorified because through his death he goes to the Father. He's, he's glorified and lifted up on the cross. I think, I'm assuming this isn't new to you. My servant will be raised and lifted up, and you see there in the Greek, and glorified. So I think it's a suffering servant illusion. Jesus is the servant of the Lord. And yes, it's a bloody death, but John wants you to see his death is the means by which he goes to the Father. Right? It's the means by which he's glorified. It's the means by which he's exalted. And he appropriates the servant's song of Isaiah 52. John, of course, is not denying. He's not denying in the least that Jesus suffered. Of course he suffered. But he emphasizes the glory in the suffering. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Again, we see the Passover theme. Maybe Isaiah 53 again. I, I, again, G, John uses the word hubago and poor you am I to speak of Jesus' death. So per, um, when Jesus says, I'm going to him who sent me, I'm going away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Notice that language in John, but it's always I'm going via the cross. It's not just I'm going, goodbye, but it's, there's a certain route, right? There's a certain path. The glory, the glory comes, the glory comes through, through the cross. Any, now I, I'm doing that very fast. Anything you want to say about the, the cross there in John? Okay, believing in John. The verb, 98 times. I mentioned that before. What are the parallels for believing? I think this is enormously interesting. What does it mean to believe? Of course, the verb is so prominent, but he uses many parallel terms, which we're just going to look at quickly. It means that you receive him. Have you ever had someone say to you, 
I have, that it's wrong to say that you ought to receive and accept Christ. I've had people say that to me. They tend to be very reformed. And I say, what? It's there, right? There can be wrong understandings of that, but John uses as many as received him, as many as accepted him. That's, that's fine language to use. But he can also use the language of obeying him. What does it mean to be saved? It means to receive him. It means to obey him. I love this one. It means to hear him. Those who hear the voice of the Son of God will live. The sheep listen to my voice. So, you know, a lot of people hear the gospel, right? But they hear it and they don't hear it. I, I was saved when I was 17. I told you that out of Roman Catholicism. I started going to Sunday school in a conservative Baptist church. And uh, I had no idea what Protestantism was like. As a Catholic, I gave no thought to Protestantism. I didn't care about religion at all. That's how I would describe it. Protestants would sometimes ask me in high school, why are you a Catholic? Are you a Christian? And I'd always say, I'm a Catholic. <laughs> what a strange question. You know, that was just incomprehensible to me that anybody would ask me that. But anyway, so I'd never, I didn't even, I don't think I even knew Protestants had Sunday school. But I remember sitting there and thinking, as we're studying the Bible, this is fabulous. Because I was saved, right? I was listening to the sheep's voice. And I'd look around and I'd look at these other kids and I'd think, these kids are so blessed. But I recognized as time went on, oh, a lot of these kids are born to death. <laughs> they don't care about this. I didn't, it, took me, it took me months, even years, to recognize that with some people. But they, they weren't hearing his voice, right? We were hearing the same things, but they weren't hearing. You can hear and not hear. What does it mean to be saved? You hear the voice of the Son of God. That's what the sheep do. The, what does it mean to believe? It means you come. You know, believing, believing isn't, isn't just intellectual recognition, is it? That's not what accepting is. It means you, you come to him for life. What a beautiful image. What does it mean to be saved? When we're saved, we come to him for life. It means, it means that we behold him. It means that we see him. There's, there's seen and there's not seen. You know, I'm, I'm very bad at seeing things. I'm a very unobservant person. I can drive down the same street where our church is, and I don't know a, a store that's been there, even though I've driven by the church 15 years. Because I live, it's a, it's a strength and a weakness. I live inside of my head. I'm almost always thinking of something else. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not very observant. I'm very directionally challenged, you know? Um, but, right, they're seeing, so I'm looking at that store, or whatever it is, but I'm not really seeing it, right? They're seeing and they're seeing. Those who are saved really see who he is. Here's another beautiful image. They eat him, right? They eat. What does it mean to believe? It means to eat. It means to eat, eat his flesh, Jesus says. What a beautiful image of, of, of faith. Uh, you know, Augustine said about this passage, believe and you have eaten. Oh, exactly right, right? When, when, we, when we eat, we believe. It means you enter. If you enter, you enter into the gate. Very much like coming, isn't it? Entering. Uh, another, another expression, abiding. You know, maybe abiding is not a very good word. Nobody says abide anymore, right? Remaining, continuing. Maybe those are better words, to remain in him, to continue in him. It means to go to him. But you remember these beautiful words after many, you know, this is one of my favorite passages when the people are leaving Jesus because he's spoken a hard word, that hard, that hard word. You know, I said eating, we should say drinking too, right? Eating and drinking. Do I not have drinking on here? I skipped it. Okay, yeah, there's eating and drinking, so I miss drinking, but there it is. Anyway, Jesus says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Many are scandalized by this word. Many fall away. Jesus comes to the disciples, and what does he say to them? He says, well, thank, thankfully, 
you know, everybody's leaving me, but I'm so thankful that you're with me. Thanks for sticking with me. No, that's not what he says. He said, do you want to leave too? <laughs> Jesus isn't worried, is he? And, and Peter says, to whom shall we go? Go, there it is. You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and we've come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So there's that sense, those who are saved, we're, we're not going anywhere else. I, 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 lo I love how Jesus there is, is, not, is not worried. One, one of the things we've emphasized in our church as we encourage people to give, but I just preached a couple of years ago some sermons on 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, never want to sound desperate with our people. Please give. Oh, please. We need it so bad. I would say God's, God's going to meet the needs in this church. God's going to meet the needs in this church. The issue is, are you going to have the joy of participating in giving? It's a joy. It's a joy to give. We trust God to meet the needs of what's going on here. We encourage you to give, but for your benefit. We'll, we'll, God, God's going to provide. And, um, you know, we see that model in Jesus. Jesus isn't worried. Those, those who believe their eyes are open, we kind of saw that already. The sheep follow him, right? We, so we've seen coming and entering. I mean, I could, we could put these metaphors under metaphors of movement, right? Metaphors of perception, like tasting and eating and drinking and seeing. It means we hate one's life. The, the sheep are drawn to him. And then just another image, those, those who belong to God, this isn't so much believing, right? But those who belong to God, their, their, their feet are washed, and then they love him, they keep his word, and they know him. So it's just very fascinating to see the richness in John of what belief is, the fullness of belief in John. And John also tells us... Um, People, why don't people believe they love the darkness more than the light? Very interesting. They want praise from people, chapter 5. They want other people to praise them. They love the glory of man more than the glory of God. And then there's, uh, then there's those who believe. You have to read context, right? There's those who believe but don't really believe. There's two passages that say that. All right, so um, just to notice in John fulfillment themes, the miracle at Cana. I mean, what, what's that story about? After I became a Christian, you know, my dad, um, I had my first glass of beer, by the way, when I was five. I grew up in a Catholic family. You know, he just poured me a little glass of beer. My dad, I, you know, I tried to tell him, what does it mean to become a Christian? It means I believe in Jesus but, you know, this is the 1970s, a different time. And my dad said, you've become a Baptist. And he said, Baptists don't drink. Baptists don't smoke. And Baptists don't dance. He goes, Baptists don't have any fun. That's what he told me. <laughs> and I said, you know, that, I, at the time, I am a Baptist, but I said, you know, Dad, I've become a Christian. It isn't about, it about those things. But my dad would point to the story in John 2, and he would said, look, Jesus made the wine, and he wanted everyone to have a good time. My dad didn't do a lot of biblical exegesis, but he did, he did appear, appeal to that passage. Well, of course, I think they did drink wine, but um, I think the point of the story is the sweet wine stripping off the mountains, right? Do you remember that? The new creation has come. That's the point of the story, and that's why those old water pots of Judaism with water, they're being replaced with the new sweet wine that Jesus is giving and the, the new age has come. The new creation has arrived. So it's not fundamentally about, well, we're, thankfully, we have enough wine for the feast. Of course, that happens as well. But the point is, the first miracle indicates the, the days of fulfillment are here in Jesus Christ. The days of the fulfillment of the promises and the prophets. Jesus is the true temple, says John. Right? We see that very clearly in John 2. Uh, you know, our, Jesus, says, uh, uh, Jesus says, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it. They take him literally, as they often do in John. But Jesus is speaking of his body, right? Because the true temple, Jesus is saying to them, 
The true temple is himself. John 4 again with the Samaritan woman. It, Mount Gerizim, Jerusalem. Yes, you Samaritans were wrong. It's not Mount Gerizim. Jesus says it's Jerusalem. But you know what? That's a passe issue. <laughs> that theological argument is anachronistic now because I'm the true temple now. The, the issue is not whether you worship in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. The issue is whether you worship in spirit and truth and you worship me. 